All right, so chemical shift is the idea very quickly that was introduced, which I saw with James sort of a light bulb go on, that the frequency at which a proton resonates is going to be proportional to the applied magnetic field. So for example, tetramethyl silane at a 70,500 Gauss magnet undergoes precession. The protons undergo precession or flip their spin at 300 cycles, 300 million cycles per second. If we take that same molecule of TMS and put it into a 117,500 Gauss magnet, then TMS undergoes precession and flips its spin at 500 million hertz. But what happens is, OK, so if we now have just sort of a plain vanilla methyl group, so not TMS, not a methyl group on silicon, but a methyl group on an alkyl chain, the methyl group is going to undergo precession at approximately whoops, 300 million, 300, later on I'll be saying it's closer to 300 million, 270, but we'll just use 300 million, 300 for round numbers at the 70,000 Gauss magnet and at the 117,000 Gauss magnet, it's going to undergo precession at 500 million 500 hertz. So rather than saying, oh, at a certain magnet, we're 300 hertz downfield of TMS, and a different magnet, we're 500 megahertz downfield of TMS, we can just normalize and say in both of these cases, we are 1 ppm downfield. Downfield means higher frequency than TMS. And so that normalization allows us to compare the frequencies of protons regardless of the magnet that we're using. And of course, if we go ahead, the math is really simple here. So if I tell you that the methyl group in methane thiol undergoes uh, resonance 600 hertz downfield of TMS, and I asked you how many hertz would it be on the 117,000 Gauss magnet, how many would it be? 1,000, exactly. But in both cases, it would be how many ppm? 2 ppm. So when you look at the x-axis of an NMR spectrum, and remember I said we transformed our time axis in the FID to a frequency axis, you now know 1 ppm, the span from 0 to 1, or 1 to 2, or 2 to 3, corresponds to 300 hertz on a 300 hertz, 300 megahertz NMR spectrometer. It corresponds to 500 hertz on a 500 megahertz spectrometer. And conversely, since coupling constant is independent in frequency, and we'll get to that later on, versus uh, of, of the applied magnetic field, that triplet of, say, a methyl group in ethanol is going to look tighter. It's going to look more close together on the 500 megahertz NMR spectrometer because that triplet is still going to be 7 plus 7 is 14 hertz wide. But 14 hertz wide on a 300 megahertz spectrometer is 14 three hundredths of a ppm, whereas 14 hertz wide on a 500 megahertz spectrometer is 14 five hundredths ppm. So instead, here you'll span two one hundredths of a ppm. And if I'm doing the math right in my 
my head. And here we'll span a little less than two one hundredths of a ppm. So the peaks will be tighter and more dispersed on a higher field spectrometer. All right. Chemical shift depends on the electronic environment that the protons are in. And this was what the physicists were so upset and why they gave it this contemptuous name. If you have an element that pulls electron density away from the proton, so for example, sulfur is a little bit electron withdrawing. It's a little bit electronegative relative to carbon. And so you pull electron density. Then the hydrogens, which are shielded by the electron cloud around them, the electrons oppose the applied magnetic field, have less electron density, and so they feel a stronger magnetic field, and hence resonate at a higher frequency. So TMS, the silicon's a little bit electron donating. It shows up upfield, lower frequency. Here in methane thiol, it shows up downfield at higher frequency. And there really is a nice relationship. You can see this in the case of the halogen. So if I take methyl iodide, it shows up, the methyl group obviously, at 2.10 ppm. If I take methyl bromide, it's at 2.70 ppm. If I take methyl chloride, it's at 3.05 ppm. And I'll just put ppm here. And if I take methyl fluoride, it's at 4.30 ppm. And if you look at the electronegativity, the Pauling electronegativity of the halogen, of course, as you go down the periodic table, you become less electronegative. And so by the time you, you start, well, you start with fluorine, the electronegativity is 4.0. The electronegativity of chlorine is 3.0. That of bromine is 2.8. And that of iodine is 2.4. So you can almost see here, there's almost a direct proportionality or a linear relationship. The more it's pulling electrons away from the carbon, the more you're going ahead and deshielding. So more electronegative. More electronegative substituent is more electron draw withdrawing. And that's more deshielded. Now, what's cool and what's significant is that these effects really end up being reasonably additive. And so to see if you can spot the trend and make some predictions in your head. We start with methane and the chemical shift. By the way, delta is a term that's often used to mean chemical shift in ppm. There was an older scale, tau, that was used in the 60s. The two scales were competing, and they were opposite. Delta started at 0 for TMS, and by the time you got to like an aldehyde, you'd be at 10. The tau scale, it was completely the reverse. You started at 10 for TMS, and by the time you got to like an aldehyde CH, it would be at 0. And in fact, yeah, I don't talk about this anymore. Recently, a former student from my spec class came to my office with a paper you know, for his research and was asking me about this scale. It's like, wow, I haven't seen that in a long time. He pulled a, a 1960s paper. Anyway, delta ppm, 0 0.23 for methane. If we just look at the chlorinated hydrocarbons, chlorinated methanes, and we add one chlorine, we already saw we're at 3.05. 
So in other words, we shift down two and then some ppm. So you go to dichloromethane, and it shouldn't surprise you that you go about another two ppm. You're running out of electron density, so you don't pull away quite as much with the second. But again, you jump from about 3.05 to 5.32, so that's another two and then some ppm. You go to chloroform. Where does chloroform show up? 7.27 or 7.26, right in the middle. And now, again, you go about to more ppm. And so you can start to use these ideas in your head to say, oh, I can have a reference value for one peak and then perturb it. And just as I was saying with IR spectroscopy, it's worth having a base of knowledge in your head. There's a huge amount of information in Silverstein. There's a huge amount of information in, um, in Pretch. But just like you have a vocabulary, and then sometimes you go to the dictionary, you have a vocabulary of IR. You have a vocabulary of NMR. So let me give you the way I think about IR, about NMR spectroscopy. So the sort of reference frame I keep in my head, and I can do a hell of a lot with the numbers that I'm going to give you in just the next few minutes. So the number I like to keep in my mind for sort of a plain vanilla methyl group is 0.9 ppm. That's why I said when I used 1 on the first example, it was an oversimplification. 0.9 ppm is a methyl group that's not near any electron withdrawing or electron donating group. Methyl group at an end of a chain. A plain vanilla methylene group, ditto, not near any electron withdrawing or any electron donating group, about 1.3 to 1.5 ppm. A methine group, again, not near anything in particular, is about 1.5 to 2.0 ppm. So in other words, the difference between a methyl and a methylene group, ah, let's call it about 0.4 ppm. The difference between a methylene and a methine group, let's call it about 0.5. PPM. Why is methane so low? So it's a very electron rich environment. Part of the reason you end up deshielding here is that the steric crowding is actually pushing electron density away from carbon because you'd say, oh, well, I would think of, let's say you take isobutane. You'd say, I always heard that a methyl group is electron donating. So why is the methine, why is the methine of isobutane actually shifted downfield? And one way to think of it is that the electrons are basically pushing into each other and pushing away here. So methane. Methane, and we're going to talk about how you rigorously calculate what's called, um, called empirical additivity relationships. And most of the empirical additivity relationships use methane as the starting point. They use 0.23 as the starting point. Whereas I, because we don't normally take spectra of methane, my reference frame in my mind's eye really becomes these three values here. And you can build a hell of a lot from that. And that's what I'm going to show you now. All right. So a little knowledge may be a dangerous thing, but a little knowledge is also a very valuable thing. So we already have a little knowledge that chloromethane is at 3.05 ppm. Now let's consider the methylene group in chloroethane. So where do you expect the methylene group to show up? Three point 
three point huh? zero nine. Okay, how do you get three point oh nine? Because going from a methylene well from a methyl group to a methylene is about point four. And then it, I would say it's additive because there's a chlorine. Mm -hmm. And the chlorine brought it to about three point oh five, so I've just added to it. So you're so you add point so the, the the being a methylene brings it oh, I'd say three point four five. Three point four five. Okay. Don't worry, I screw up simple arithmetic on my feet all the time. All right, and you would be darn close to right. It's actually 3.47. See, a little knowledge is not a dangerous thing. Let's take, take isopropyl chloride. Now let's try that same logic with that. Three point nine. Great. And the actual is four point one four. And guess what? That's good enough for reading a spectrum. Because now you look at a peak and you say, oh, that peak's about 4.0 ppm. That's probably not a methyl group next to something electron withdrawing. It's probably something that we're already further downfield. I want to give you a couple of other base values, and then we'll have some fun with them. All right, so all of these examples that we're looking at are alpha to an electron withdrawing group. And we can see that in general, alpha means on the carbon directly attached. And we can see that being alpha to an electron withdrawing group shifts you eh, two or three ppm downfield with respect to the base value. So for example, all right, things I'll keep in mind. I like to keep in mind, I don't know why I keep it in mind, but I happen to keep, you could say I'm going to keep methyls in mind. I happen to keep methylenes in mind because I see a lot of methylenes next to an oxygen. So a methylene in an ether group is approximately 3.6 ppm. And that kind of makes sense, right? Oxygen's a little more electron withdrawing than chlorine. It's a little further downfield. Honestly, if you said 3.5, nobody would fault you. But from that, then you can go ahead and say, oh, if it were a methyl group, we'd be closer to 3 parts per million, maybe 3.2 parts per million. If it were a methine group, we'd be a little further downfield, we'd be maybe at 4.1 ppm. So again, you have that baseline of knowledge. It shouldn't surprise you that if you have more electron withdrawing, it's going to shift you even further downfield. And so if you have a methylene next to an ester, you go a little bit further downfield. And I don't know, maybe because I've seen far too many samples of mine with a little bit of ethyl acetate left over in them after running a column, I'll always think of a methylene next to an ester group as being a little further downfield at 4.1 ppm. All right, so this is alpha to an electron withdrawing group. Now, we all know about the inductive effect. And so if you have beta to an electron withdrawing group, you would expect to have some effect, but not nearly to be as big as alpha to an electron withdrawing group. In other words, if we have X, C, C, H, the inductive effect of your electron withdrawing group, X, is going to pull electron density away from the alpha carbon and from hydrogens on it. 
that in turn is going to pull it away from the beta carbon and hydrogens on it. And we're going to see a smaller effect. So what I keep in mind is about 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 ppm more downfield. In other words, then say the resting value that you would have, the, the original value. And in general, what do I mean by electron withdrawing groups? I'll be pretty generous here. Halogen, oxygen, let's say nitrogen, anything that's electronegative. Also, a carbonyl, a carbonyl may be a little bit, little bit less, even things like a benzene. So that's, that's worth keeping in mind. OK, so what does that tell us? If you take a molecule like ethanol, and forget about the OH right now, what would you expect for the CH2 in ethanol? Around 3.6. And what would you expect for the CH3 in ethanol? 1.3, 1.4, somewhere, somewhere around there. In other, words, in other words, you would expect since a normal plain vanilla methyl would be at 0.9, and you have an electron drawing group beta, it's going to be a little further, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, somewhere around there. All right. Last. piece of information I keep I like to keep handy in my head and I don't know why here I always like to keep a methyl group again maybe it's the ethyl acetate problem maybe it's the fact that I'm used to seeing ethyl acetate methyl group next to a carbonyl typically about 2 ppm if you want to get fussy, you can go ahead and say, oh, it's closer to 2.1 ppm. But again, for keeping numbers in your head, I've just thrown out a very small amount of data to you that you can do a hell of a lot with. And so put two in your head. You can go ahead and file two other things that you'll also have. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But if you want to, you can also talk about a methyl group at a benzene as about 2 ppm, and also, or, or any sort of benzylic off of, off of a heterocycle. And it'll be a little bit of a cheat because it's really closer to 1.7. But if you fit all three of these into your head as two parts per million, again, you'll have that baseline knowledge. Again, if you want to prefer 1.7, if you've got a good memory for an allylic methyl, take 1.7. All right, let's take a moment to see how a little knowledge really is a very powerful thing. So let us take the molecule ethyl pentanoate. And let's apply, let's apply the knowledge that we've just talked about, the information basically basically on the, this blackboard and what I said before for those baseline values. And tell me, take a moment to think about the chemical shift of each type of proton in the molecule.
right, so let's start, let's start with that methylene. What do we figure? Three point six or four point one and why? Four point one, it was my reference reference value. And again, if you estimated three point six, you wouldn't be doing badly on that. Electron withdrawing group, two and a half ppm more downfield than the three ppm more downfield than the the reference value, somewhere somewhere like that. But if you happen to have that value I gave you for ethyl acetate in your head, basically, you know, something, a methylene next to an ethyl group, next to an oxygen ester, yeah, 4.1. This guy over here, the methyl group, 1.4, 1.5, does it matter? Two pushes it because it's, so it's beta, to an oxygen, so yeah, so 1.4 1. 1. versus, right, it would be 0. 0.9 plus 0. 0. 0. 0.5. Yeah, 0. 0.5, somewhere around there, 1.4, 1. 1.3. 1. What about this guy here? 2. 3.6? Two, that's 2 ppm as the value for, so this is 2 ppm, and so if we, I guess my thinking on this is if we say, ah, methylene's another you know, four tenths of a ppm from, yeah, so probably 2.4. All right, hold off on these two for a second. This methyl group? 0. 0.9. This methylene group? This one. One five, one six. Other votes on this? One point eight. Okay, well, we're going to see in a second. So we have a. What about this methylene group here? One point three. Other votes? One. One point four. You're figuring maybe gamma, maybe a little bit. All right, let's, let's pull the spectrum and see. So one of the things you'll find is the Sigma Aldrich library, the Sigma Aldrich catalog, www.sial.com, has lots and lots of NMR spectra, and I will pull lots of them for the course. I think we need to send, send some of those over here. So you can actually look at real spectra and test, test your knowledge of things. And you can find cool examples. All right, so this is the spectrum. We have peaks at 4.1. It's hard staring into the light, so I've scrawled it here. Um, looks like, whoops, boy, I can't see. I'm absolutely blind here. 2.3, 1.6, 1.4, 1.3, and 0.9. And so we can, we can really calibrate ourselves. That 4.1 value is dead on, but that's basically what I told you it would be. The 0.9 is dead on. The Methyl here is at 1.3, so that's right about where we expected to see it. The methylene, that's alpha to the carbonyl, is at 2.3, so that's you know, 0 0.2 to 0.5 ppm downfield of that reference value of 2 ppm. The methylene that's beta is 1.6, so it's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 ppm downfield of that reference value of 1.2 or 1.3 to 1.5. And the next methylene is at about 1.4, the gamma methylene, so right within the range for not perturbed 
a whole heck of a lot or maybe just perturbed by being gamma just a, a hair over where it would be. All right, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this is there's no replacement for being able to intuit, to being able to read a spectrum and be able to know where different things come up. And having that knowledge will take you far. There are many ways of calculating more precisely chemical shifts. Pretch gives in great detail, and they're just beautiful procedures in there for, for calculating chemical shifts that involve alpha effects, gamma, beta effects, gamma effects, adding everything up and coming up with good values. Generally, the best of these will take you within, on the average for a molecule, within about three to five ppm. In other words, uh, I'm sorry, that's carbon. For a proton, within a few tenths of a ppm on the average. ChemDraw does this extremely well for any of you who have fancy versions of ChemDraw. Um, ChemDraw has, for the non-fancy version, doesn't have this. You all have available for free ChemDoodle, and it's a licensed version from the department. They, are, they have implemented many of the features of ChemDraw. They have their own additivity procedures that are very similar to the estimations that we're doing here. I don't like theirs as much. They have a few odd factors. I didn't introduce this in the course last year because there were enough errors in the program. And in fact, today's example was sufficiently botched that, that, um, that they actually got it, got it wrong. And I've been in communication with the company. But we'll take, take the same example of ethyl pentanoate. So you all have this available in your your own toolbox. All right, so here's a rather disappointing drawing of ethyl pentanoate. And if I can. If I can drag this, wah. it's a little hard to, if I can drag this right over here. So that is a simulator that's doing essential, <laughs> what? So it does have chloroform in there. There are a bunch of silly, silly settings on this thing. So for example, it basically, remember how I said your multiplets get narrower at higher frequency because the PPM is, is um, because a PPM is, is more hertz. So let's take a look. So here's the thing. If you look at this, so I can click on those hydrogens. And its estimation procedure is a little bit different. It says we're going to use two for a methylene, and then we're going to add one ppm for being next to a carbonyl. There's another correction. It comes up with 2.3. And if we click on, ah, crap. This thing is a, oh, you have to do done for each of these. If I do do this one, it's estimating it at 1.5. And of course, you don't have to, have to click on it. You can just highlight it. This is 1.3. This is 0.9. This is 4.01. <coughs> this is 1.4. So it is essentially doing exactly the same thing that we've done. And the same for the C13 NMR shifts, for example, the carbon that are, that's next to the oxygen. That's a handy tool, as is, as is Pretch. I want to show you one more way of doing estimates. And another way of uh, 
Another way of doing estimates is based on fragments. So I want to show you this molecule, and there's also another point that will come out of this. So let's take this 3-methyl-2-pentanone as an example. And also from Pretch, and I've just photocopied this just to help show you the Pretch is great for a bunch of things. We're going to get to molecules like pyridines and paroles and thiophenes. And there are really nice tables of coupling constants in there where they have J values. And that's going to be relevant as you start to attack some of the homework problems that have pyridines and thiophenes in them. So there are some really nice, nice reference tables in there. All right, so I want to show you, you can send, send them on over. So this is just somebody having, having tabulated different types of molecules. And you can say, OK, let's look at acetone. And acetone is kind of like this methyl <laughs> ketone. Let's look at. 2-pentanone, and that's kind of like this part if we look out here. And let's look at isopropyl methyl ketone, and that's kind of like this part. So in other words, you can go ahead and say, all right, we're going to go ahead and make our estimates based on this for this, this for this, and this for this. And if you look at this table, the first time you see it, the, this is uh, page um, 162 and 163 from your Pretch. The first time you see it, you say, oh, it's a little confusing. OK, what is this? If we have a methyl ketone with a methyl group on it, so that's acetone, we say 2.09 for the methyl group. So if you were trying to estimate, you'd say 2.09 or call it 2.1 since nobody's going to estimate that exactly. All right, if we have a propyl ketone, so a methyl ketone with a propyl group on it, now the terminal CH3 is at 0.93. And the methylene here is at 1.56. And so you could say, OK, we'll call this 0.93. We'll just call it 0.9. And we'll call this 1.56. We'll just call this 1.6. And you notice these are the same numbers that we were estimating based on that very limited data set that I gave you. And then if we continue across the table here, we have other substituents. So here we have our methyl ketone with an isopropyl group on it. And so you say, OK, the methine of an isopropyl group is 2.54. So these are actual values taken from actual compounds tabulated by real people. Sounds like a boring project. <laughs> and 1.08. And again, these are the same principles we discussed. Methyl ketone is at 2 ppm. Methine brings you down a little bit further. We might have estimated 2.9. We find it's 2.54. Methyl group that's beta to a ketone, instead of being at 0.9, it's a couple of tenths of a ppm downfield more. 1.08. So again, I'll just tabulate these numbers here. We'll call that 1.1, 2.54. We call that 2.5. OK. So now the question comes up, how are we doing? And so we go for the real thing. And again, I've downloaded this from the www.sial.com website. Also linked to your 
your course materials. All right, so let's see how we're doing. I see a peak at 2.4 ppm, a singlet at 2.1, a multiplet at 1.7, a multiplet at 1.4, a doublet at 1.1, and a triplet at 0.9. All right, you st start with the triplet, that's easy. We're doing pretty good there. You go ahead, you say, all right, what else, what else is kind of easy? We have this doublet here at 1.1. That's exactly where we expect. We have our third methyl group here at 2.1. That's where we expect. We're doing pretty well on our methine at 2.4. All right, what's, what's happening here? So it's not a chiral center, but it's, it, no, the, there's two hydrogens there, but if you replace one, you'd have different enantiomers, so it's enantiomeric. They, okay, so first of all, I guess the question is, is this a chiral center? Oh, dice. Yeah, okay, and this is, this is one of the points of, of why I put this up, up here. So we have a chiral center in the molecule. If you have a chiral center in the molecule, every methylene group will be diastereotopic. The two hydrogens here are diastereotopic. They are topologically different. doesn't matter how fast you rotate. And rotation about single bonds with very, very rare exception that I will tell you about is always fast at room temperature. Slow rotation is almost never the answer if you're dealing with, with only single bonds being involved. This is a question of topology. And you would have no trouble seeing this if it were on a ring to say, oh, one proton is up, one proton is down. We have a chiral center in the molecule. Of course we have 50% of one, 50% of the other. But it doesn't matter because in this molecule, this hydrogen says I'm on the same side as the methyl. This one says I'm opposite. That's a simple way of, as you said, imagining replacing one with a deuterium and saying, oh, then I'm a one diastereum or, or I'm another. And we're going to come more to this. But the simple, so the simple level of explanation I'm going to give right now is if you have a stereocenter in the molecule, every methylene group is topologically diastereotopic. Diastereotopic protons are not the same. To put it in more technical terms, they are not chemically equivalent. Again, we're going to come to this later. Sometimes they will be coincident, which means they will show up at the same position and behave as if they're the same, particularly if they're very far from the stereocenter. But topologically, every methylene group in a molecule, no matter how long that chain is, is diastereotopic. Every isopropyl group, if you put an isopropyl group in a molecule with a stereocenter, the two methyl groups are diastereotopic. They are not chemically equivalent. They often show up different chemical shift. 
and as we will see later, and they split each other. Because protons that aren't the same do split each other. If you have what? Doesn't matter if you have a racemate because, and it is the racemate, because this proton here and this proton here show up at the same chemical shift. And this proton here and this proton here show up at the same chemical shift. Because in one case, one looks at the stereocenter and says, I'm a pro-R proton, and that's an S stereocenter. So I have this relationship. And then in the other molecule, the other proton says, I'm a pro-S proton, and that stereocenter is an R stereocenter. And so you have the same topological relationship of those opposite protons to the stereocenter. Absolutely. They could either be separated and what we would call first order or near first order like this, or they could be close to each other forming a bigger multiplet, or they could be completely coincident and not, not visibly splitting each other. And in general, the further you are from the stereocenter, the less different in environment they see. And so the more likely they are to fall in that category of not splitting each other. Not easily, but a great, great question. And actually, I mean, the answer is, the answer becomes yes. By conformational analysis, because what you need to consider becomes the three, the three different rotomers and then the proximity of each of those two diastereotopic protons to the carbonyl, which is creating the magnetic anisotropy. So the answer becomes yes under special circumstances. And in the case of making diastereomeric derivatives, like Mosher ester derivatives, one can do it in a systematic fashion. And the Rignovsky group is doing this in systematic ways with other sorts of groups. And again, being able to do it in a systematic fashion means that you can then determine, if you have a molecule and you make a chiral derivative, you can determine the absolute stereochemistry, which is extremely important when you're developing new, new reactions. All right, I want to finish by adding to our little baseline of knowledge. And I'm going to throw out some numbers. So what I talked about before was the stuff that I really think is core to figuring out so much. Let me throw out some others. Alcohols move around depending on hydrogen bonding, let's say 1 to 5 ppm. Carboxylic acids, so I'm talking now about various protons on oxygen, generally 10 to 13 ppm, sometimes not seen due to exchange with water in chloroform. If I want to see my carboxylic acids, use DMSO. or keep your sample dry. Dry and maybe more concentrated. All right, aromatic alcohols, AROH, phenols, and the like, again, about 4 to 7 ppm. And these are all going to be approximate numbers. All right, aromatics in general, I think everyone knows that aromatic protons appear downfield. So if you have sort of ARH, meaning like an arene, a benzene, a thiophene, a pyridine. Um, benzene itself, C6H6, is at 7.3. Here we're talking generally 7 to 8, but these ranges are loose. Electron withdrawing groups will bring you further. Electron donating groups will bring further downfield. Electron donating groups will bring you upfield. 
I can show you aromatic protons that occur at the low 6 ppm numbers. I can show you aromatic protons that appear at 9 ppms. In the case of all of these, you're getting magnetic anisotropy due to ring current. A nice model for what's going on is a classical model. If you apply a magnetic field to a solenoid, the solenoid generates, and you can think of the pi electrons in the benzene as a solenoid, the solenoid generates a current in the ring of electrons that opposes the applied magnetic field. That generates flux lines that go down and come round and point up over here. So this proton feels a stronger magnetic field. I'll say feels stronger magnetic field and show it shows up downfield. That same type of argument can be used for vinyl protons. You can treat the pi electrons here as also being like a ring current. Generally, we're talking, let's say, generally 5 to 6. And again, I can show you ones that lie outside that range. In the case of an aldehyde, where you have an electron withdrawing carbonyl, we're talking maybe 9 to 10 ppm. These same principles here, which I talked about, really apply at a distance over here. So all of these cases, allylic, ben, uh, benzylic, and alpha to carbonyl go a little further downfield than where you would expect a regular methyl group on a benzene or on a double bond or just, you know, so I'm saying, in other words, a regular methyl would be 0.9. We go about a ppm further downfield. All right. The one oddball in this whole equation, and it, again, you can draw a ring current explanation for it, is alkynes. And I think that that's going to kind of wrap up common protons. And then I want to give you one last summary. Your ring current you can think of as going like this in the case of alkynes, which actually reinforces, which actually opposes the applied magnetic field. So alkynes are about 2.5 ppm. All right. Just as I like to be able to read an IR spectrum, I like to be able to read an NMR spectrum. And when I read an NMR spectrum, I generally look from about 0 to about 10 ppm. Of course, you may have things that are upfield of 0. You may have things that are downfield. And I generally think of this region as aldehydes. This region, I'm deliberately drawing this as very loose ranges because you can find aromatics that fall outside. But this range here as aromatics, this range here as alkenes, this range over here as next to an electron withdrawing group, alpha to an electron withdrawing group. Nitrogen's a little less downfield shifting, so a little more upfield. This range here as alpha to carbonyl, allylic, and benzylic. And remember, we're talking methine, methylene, methyl. Kind of over here for methine. Kind of over here for methylene. And kind of over here methyl. So this is how I look at an NMR spectrum and try to try to read it. All right, next time we will pick up, we'll talk a little bit about carbon NMR and then we're going to move on to discuss spin-spin um, coupling and and other factors that are involved. I guess next time, yeah, we'll we'll get both of those. <laughs>